have uh, with me here today, as Asma said, um, Arun and Jennifer. Arun is professor at NYU Stern School of Business, and he's done a lot of research on digital economies and how information technology is impacting business and society. And actually, uh, he's one of the first professors who's really been doing a lot of great research on the sharing economy, trying to bring facts behind everything that we're being um, able to observe. And actually, um, I met him two years ago. He almost came to the first WeShare Fest, but there were some visa issues. And so unfortunately, that didn't end up working. But um, this is now the second time he's here, so um, I'm happy that we can continue discussing. And um, with me here is also Jennifer, um, the CEO of Couchsurfing. Um, and so uh, just to, to kick off this round, uh, before going into the topic of the sharing economy and human connectedness, um, maybe each of you can just say a few words about like how did you end up in the sharing economy, um, researching it or working in it, and what is it that drew you to the subject? Arun? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really awesome to be back here. Um, I think that this is a space like no other and a... Um, community like no other, and so I'm delighted to be here. Um, you know, I started researching the sharing economy because I was interested in trust, uh, what causes people to trust each other, and um, my hope was that we would, um, you know, increase the ways in which we could sort of exchange things with other people in an economic context because of um, sites like Facebook emerging that were digitizing social capital. Um, my, my guess is that it probably would have been a passing phase, but then I found WeShare, and uh, you guys sort of really drew me in, and there was no turning back after that, and so that's why I continue to research the sharing economy. Good morning. Um, See, I could answer that a few different ways. I came to couch surfing and thus the sharing economy, as it is occasionally called, um, really because of my background in <coughs> consumer internet technology. But I stayed at couch surfing and I fell in love with it, really, because I find it a profound honor to be able to work uh, in a place and with a community that is really about a very intimate kind of connection that um, I just find quite moving. And it's, it's, I think, somewhat rare in the technology industry to really feel the way that I feel about what I do every day. Um, so I feel extremely fortunate to be part of this, this whole situation um, and of couch surfing in particular. Yeah, so that actually already brings us to the, the topic that we defined for the session today. And so when we talk about human connectedness, basically ever since the sharing collaborative economy has emerged, one of the main arguments that people always bring up, um, apart from the economic benefits, is the social benefits. So for instance, uh, many of these platforms enable people to get more in touch with their neighbors, Right, so meal sharing platforms, or if you're using couch surfing or a peer-to-peer -peer rental, you're able to meet people locally. So the social benefits are really something that are discussed a lot, and I think uh, used as a really important argument for why this is a great new innovation. But I think that uh, there's a lack of data and information on, is this really happening? Um, and also, uh, as we were saying, technology does seem to often isolate in a way, and we're using apps to connect ourselves with our neighbors when we used to maybe actually just be in touch with them anyway. So um, maybe, Arun, you can say a little bit about uh, the historical development, technology, what effect has that had in the past uh, on people being isolated or more connected? Okay, well, yeah, see, um yeah, I, I think a really important part of what will sustain, um, you know, these uh, emerging sharing economies, um, these forms of exchange that we're starting to sort of make part of our lives at, at scale, is are the connections that we start to form with the people who we exchange with. And, um, 
you know, in, in, in some ways to me, that's one of the most compelling dimensions of the sharing economy because you know, if you go back, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor, so I'm gonna give you a little history lesson here. If you go back 150 years, um, maybe not all the way back to Marx, but certainly to Durkheim and the late 19th century, um, and his observation that like, you know, the, that economic development and technological progress was isolating people from their communities. It was causing this sort of fragmentation of the individual from the community group. And you fast forward to the 1950s and you see a similar message uh, coming from the work of Robert Nisbet, um, who again was talking about the isolating effects of economic development. And all the way to um, like, you know, over the last 10 years, um, Sherry Turkle from MIT has written like, you know, this wonderful series of books that talks about the isolating sort of effects of digital technologies, how digital technologies create these ties to other people that are not emotive, that somehow we are tethered to other people without having sort of rich, high bandwidth interactions. And so, you know, I'm fascinated by, you know, I, I, I guess by um, platforms like Meetup. Uh, you just heard from Scott, because Meetup is an example of creating purpose-driven community dynamically, right? I mean, you're not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to, you know, connect with your sort of your church group or your rotary club or a particular sort of well-defined community group. You are dynamically creating community as a natural byproduct of living your life, of your interest in something. And it's the same thing with a lot of sharing activities, right? Um, these aren't platforms that are saying, come to me because I'll give you a way to connect with other people. These are platforms that are saying, or like, you know, sort of ways of exchange that are saying that I'll help you find a place to stay, I'll help you get transportation, I'll help you get food, I'll help you get money. But as a byproduct, you are also sort of changing as a human being. In some sense, when you get past that point where you can trust someone enough, to lend them money, to sort of give them your spare bedroom, to let them sleep on your couch, to sit in the front seat with you when you're sort of taking a ride, um, to sit at your dining table and have a meal. You cross a barrier that sort of gets you more connected with human beings in general, because in a sense, you're sort of getting some practice for what it's like to have sort of a high bandwidth emotive connection, and you're doing it as a byproduct of like, you know, getting something that you need rather than as a dedicated activity. Oh, I have to connect with other people. But so you're saying that maybe um, the sharing economy is an exception um, in this, that technology is act actually leading to more connection. Uh, ab absolutely, I mean, I see, um, it, it, it's possible that like in the 1950s, there was someone like, there was a group like ours that sort of had found pockets of technological development that were leading to greater connectedness and that felt that they had found evidence that ran counter to sort of like, you know, the narrative of the last hundred years. But, you know, I've looked for it and I haven't been able to find it. So, so, I'm, so I'm fascinated by um, the, the, the prospect that we may have reached this inflection point where rather than taking us further apart, technological progress might actually in some ways bring us close together. And we can't sort of take this for granted. I mean, this isn't sort of a done deal because you've got sites like Instacart as well in the United States that um, like, you know, frees you from the hassle of having to go to the grocery store. Um, so you don't actually interact with another human being when you're getting your groceries. You can sit at home and order it and like, you know, someone will shop for you and bring it for you. On the other side, you have uh, La Rouche Que de Vie, uh, the food assembly in France where it's making grocery shopping a much more community-based activity. You order online, but you gather in this warehouse and you sort of interact with each other as you're doing that activity. So which one will dominate the Instacart narrative or the food assembly narrative? We don't know yet, but there's certainly sort of promise here. Okay, but so since this is pretty new, I guess we don't have that much data yet to really prove that this is happening. Um, but from your experience in couch surfing, and I mean, it's been around for a long time, and I think uh, the platform has evolved quite a bit. 
Uh, do you feel there's some kind of proof or just experience that shows that this reconnection is really happening? So I, I guess I would say that with, with social and sharing economy platforms in general, it's, it's our choice. Um, and it's, our, it's sometimes a difficult choice because we're humans and we fall into habitual patterns of tapping on things and looking down at our phone instead of up at our neighbors. Yeah. Um, but so, so I would say that as a general statement and I think it's, it's up to us collectively to remember to stay connected to each other and to get up in the morning and remember that uh, that love is a powerful force and that connection is a powerful force and that those are the things that actually make us happy and and have have some promise for the future and our future generations. One of the things I love about couch surfing is it really is about creating offline connection. And uh, in the early days, certainly there weren't the, the technical capacities that there are now to sort of stay as tethered to your device. Um, so it's very much in its roots to get you offline um, when b being online was not as compelling when it started, certainly. Um, I, I think I, there's a little quote here that I want to read, and I can put this into my own words, but the, the words of a couch surfer seem to, to sum up what, how I feel about it and what I hear people say a lot, which is that it, it really creates a kind of intimacy with strangers and um, establishes a notion of a world as a friendly place. So one of the things we say about couch surfing is that you have friends all over the world. And I, I like to hold that just as a notion because I think that that is an incredibly powerful notion for, for a number of reasons and, and a desperately needed notion. And I say that not as a software developer or a developer of a platform for, uh, for connecting people, but as a human being and as a parent. Um, so, so this is a quote by a woman, her name's Clara Benson, and she has a forthcoming book in which couch surfing is featured. It's called No Baggage. Um, and it's a little out of, it's, it's, she says, this is the odd intimacy of couch surfing, a digital tribe that encourages floating in and out of strangers' lives, occasionally in underwear. To invite a stranger into your most private space is a radical act of trust one that tends to compress traditional relationship arcs into an ultra-concentrated couple-day span. And that's really the thing that I love about couch surfing. There's a tremendous, tremendous intimacy in waking up with a stranger in your pajamas. And the types of conversations that I have had with the people I've hosted on couch surfing and the people who've been kind enough to host me and the people who've come into our offices and talked about the way it's transformed or changed their lives or transformed or exchanged, it, it, it changed their experience of the world or of another culture are really, really profound. It's difficult almost for me to put into words. Um, but I think that, it, it again, it's really up to us to remember how we carry ourselves through the world and, and how we interact with each other both online and off. And I think that platforms, online platforms have a tremendous amount of potential for us to support one another um, and, and feel less alone, but it can tip certainly into a, an isolation where you speak less to your 80-year-old 80 old, 80 old neighbor because he's not on Facebook. And uh, you know, in, in, in some sense, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's a really awesome quote because to me it raises, um, I mean, it, it there are at least three things, the prospect of three things that sort of come out of it. Um, one is um, just simply the, the um, there is a certain sort of intimacy from sharing your space and from sharing someone else's space. If you become a couch surfing um, sort of provider, if you become an Airbnb provider, um, the very act of opening your home to a stranger um, I've spoken to a number of people at Airbnb about this, and it seems like, you know, that a, a common narrative seems to be that it changes who you are, right? And as a guest as well, as you are sort of, you know, you're interacting with a person's life, even if you're not being sort of hosted with them, sort of co-located with you, 
you're interacting with sort of details of their life that are sort of, that are intimate. And in some sense, that sort of changes you as a person. And so there is sort of this intimacy from, and the same thing, like, you know, sharing a seat in someone's car, sharing a sort of a spot at someone's dining table. Um, I think that that's, there's going, to, I mean, my hope is that, like, you know, this will cause a shift in how we sort of view the world. And my, the, the, the second point that that leads to is really, um, you know, this could potentially, this kind of interaction, you know, that you describe on couch surfing, right? of um, like, you know, it's, you know, s some of the benefits accrue from that particular interaction, right? Um, you know, the interaction between the person whose couch it is and the person sleeping on the couch, right? But I think it also changes our attitude towards connecting with other people in general. And there's been a lot of evidence over the last decade that like, you know, a number of the United States and a number of countries in Western Europe are facing this crisis of connection. Um, loneliness is almost sort of, has reached epidemic proportions. Um, there's a lot of research in the last few years that has shown that we feel social pain in the same way that we feel physical pain. Like neurologically, the lack of sufficient connection to other human beings causes sort of the neuroreceptors to sort of light up um, in a way that is similar to when you are sort of inflicted with physical pain. And so, and, but we don't know how to sort of overcome this. And so I think the act of interacting with people, like, you know, through sites like Couchsurfing, in this sort of, in the um, sharing economy, um, is going to sort of open us up to a more sort of fulfilling, so it, it, in, in some sense, it sort of trains us how to be better sort of like human beings in terms of connecting with other human beings. It potentially raises our levels of trust. And the third point um, is just simply that I hope that like, you know, as these behaviors scale, that we're able to sort of preserve those intimacies because sometimes when things get big, they sort of like, you know, start to get yeah. less personal. That's exactly um, one of the points I think that's really critical. So is if we look at the platforms that are very successful today, um, especially Airbnb, for instance, um, that are really trying to focus on the transaction and the standardization of the experience. Um, I think I see a real tension there between trying to grow, um, staying true to the mission, uh, and often seeing that in this growth, the many standardizations are introduced and possibly the room for the social interaction decreases. And so uh, I don't know how you feel about it, whether this is a necessary development. Uh, do we need to, to be mainstream? Do we need these processes to become more standardized, to have more trust and make people really uh, be able to feel like I'm sure that this is going to be um, the exact service that I expected? Or um, is there really room for both of them uh, when you get larger? So this is a this is a question that I take a lot from from couch surfing community members or people who are um, sort of concerned about the preservation of the ethos, and what what I generally say is so so I I, I guess I, I want to start by making a little bit of a distinction between couch surfing and Airbnb both 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 of which I love. But if you go onto Airbnb, you see, pl see photographs of places, primarily. And when you go onto couch surfing, you see photographs of people, primarily. So that, that's kind of one, one way I think about the fundamental difference is that when you're using couch surfing, you really are signing up to meet people, whether it's through staying with them or going to a couch surfing event, that kind of thing. Um, so, so it's a little bit of a different, a different uh, value proposition. Um, I think that you know the idealist in me uh, wants to believe and does fundamentally believe that the more people we can share these things with and these ways of interacting, the better the world will be, right? So you can go on to couch surfing or Uber or whatever. You can have a great experience. You can go on to the same site a different day and have a not so great experience. That's just kind of the way life is. Um, I think that with a, with a service like couch surfing, it 
it is important to evolve it technically and evolve it in the way that the market needs it to be evolved, which is generally people like instant gratification and they want things to be easier. Um, and there is a, a, a need, I think, to, to introduce the right amount of friction into the type of interaction that you're creating. So I want a little bit of friction when I'm putting you in, in my house um, or I'm putting myself in your house. But I may want less friction when I'm going on a bike ride. So I, I think it's possible. I think there, um, like many things in life, there are sometimes conflicting interests. And as leaders, we have a responsibility to, to hold uh, to hold a lot, to hold what's important to us, to hold what's important to our stakeholders and shareholders and, um, and our communities. And, and that's, that's a responsibility to take pretty seriously. But I wouldn't say uh, that I necessarily believe everything gets diluted and worse as it gets larger. At least I hope not, uh, because, because I think we'd be kind of in trouble if that's the case. I mean, it's... Uh Just one note, because you mentioned instant gratification. Um, I think if we look at many of the, the success stories, it seems people really care about the economic value and, and the transactions. So, I mean, many of the studies also that I've seen also in Germany and many of the different uh, marketplaces I've spoken to, people just want the good as fast as possible or the transaction. I mean, Uber is also an example of that. Um, so, I mean, can we really expect people to take on this responsibility of, of caring about this human connectedness and I mean we can't just like count on them to say oh I'm gonna choose the platform where there's more friction and where I meet another person but I don't get the good as quickly I'm not sure if we can count on that happening because it seems like uh, just the data looks like it's, it's pointing a bit in the other direction well uh, uh, so you know I'm, 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 I'm not sure that in the long run <coughs> We're going to see that. Uh, well, I, I, I'd, I'd be very surprised if we saw see this bifurcation between product quality and human connection. <coughs> I mean, certainly immediacy is a good thing, and when you commoditize something, when you make it standard, um, it becomes easier to establish trust, and so it becomes easier to scale. Um, if you preserve the variety and sort of the quality of human interaction, um, you end up with a better product. And in the long run, I think that that will keep people coming back. You know, the, the story that I have heard from a lot of sharing economy participants is that they often come for the price or they come for the convenience, but they stay for the community and they stay for the quality. And I think a big part of the quality is the intimacy. So um, I agree with you, Jennifer. I don't think that it's necessarily the case that as something scales, we dilute it. But I think that that's very much governed by conscious choices that people who run platforms are making. And I think that you know, if you take um, you know, Airbnb and Uber and Lyft as three examples, um, I think that they have made very distinct choices in how they are going to sort of shape their customer experience. And as a consequence, they have, like, you know, they are going to end up with a very different quality of human interaction between the providers and the consumers of these services as a consequence. And so from sort of where you sit, sort of like, you know, atop, like, you know, the couch surfing empire, I mean, like, you know, this is... Uh, you know, an investment in preserving the human connectedness and in, I guess, um, you know, minimizing the necessary frictions that might end up being barriers to sort of human connectedness is probably sort of in the world's best interest. Yeah, I it's a balance for sure. And I think that we have to remember, um, you know, whether we're talking about the CEO of, of a company or we're talking about the ED of a nonprofit or we're talking about ourselves, that that this is, we have a shared responsibility as people to one another. So, uh, you know, I certainly have varying responsibilities as the CEO of Couchsurfing and a human being and a mother and all of those things, but, but, but we are in this together. And it's up to us to decide what's important and then, and then to move toward that. And sometimes it's important to just get a book with one click, like that, that there, but, but that's different, I think. And I hope that we, um, 
my hope is that we don't develop a trend of commoditizing humans the way that we, we commoditize perhaps strawberries um, because they're different. Okay. Well okay, sort of the, um, <laughs> I've, 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 like, you know, I've, I've firmly maintained, like, you know, sort of the distinction between humans and strawberries, um, <laughs> it's, it's, Sorry, uh, strawberries. <coughs> it's like one of my guiding principles when I come to <laughs> Paris, actually, you know. But, um, you know, th there's a project at NYU called the Project for the Advancement of Our Common Humanity that I'm a part of, and, um, it sort of recognizes this crisis of connection. It, it associates it with a lot of the world's big problems. Um, from violence to like uh, <coughs> poor educational outcomes to inequality. And um, it's got about a hundred different people working together to try and solve this. And like, you know, the reason why I'm part of it is that I see um, like, you know, as the networks become denser, as um, Scott was talking about, like, you know, earlier today, um, I think that, um, you know, the opportunity to sort of solve this crisis of connection by integrating sort of a greater level of humanity into our everyday economic activities is sort of immense. But so you would say, um, whose responsibility is it then to make that happen? The, the individual or what role do the, the marketplaces or the company play? Because we were talking earlier, um, there are developers that are creating these platforms, that are developing the apps. They're not necessarily thinking about that aspect. And so uh, whose responsibility is that? That is a big question. Um, in I two mean, sentences, and I then we have to close. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, I really do fundamentally believe that we have shared responsibility as, as human beings, as users of these services, as participants in commerce. We vote with our voices. We vote with our wallets. And, and so we have a choice. Sometimes you value convenience. Sometimes you value intimacy. Sometimes you value both. Um, I, I do think that political and corporate leaders have a certain kind of responsibility and um, that as consumers of their services, we, we have a voice in, in how we see organizations led. So I certainly take my responsibility as a leader very seriously um, and, 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 and do my best to sort of walk the talk. And I, and I think that that ends up moving through an organization, right? And an organization looks, tends to look a lot like its leader in, in, a, in a sense. I mean, there's, uh, and I, <coughs> that there is, um, you know, we, because the sharing economy is um, very heavily market driven now, um, in some sense, it's, uh, there's no one entity whose responsibility it is. Um, I think that human beings are naturally hardwired to uh, want to seek out connection where possible. And if they are given the alternative to have a more connected form of existence as opposed to an isolated form of existence, and if it's made visible to them and made readily available to them, I think that they will more naturally choose that. And in many ways, see, I'm an economist. Um, I'm not a sociologist. But the reason why I have gotten so deep, one of the reasons why I've gotten so deep into thinking about the sharing economy and human connectedness is that I think that it's fundamental to the economic future of the sharing economy. Because this is one of, like, you know, if you think clinically, like someone who is evaluating a product class, <coughs> uh, the ability to connect with other people is an essential dimension of this product class. And it's an attractive one to every human being. And so, you know, I think that the interests of society and the interests of someone who is trying to build a business based on this are uh, very well aligned. And, um, you know, Uber aside, if you look at the messaging from some of, like, you know, the platforms that have the largest amount of venture financing, I mean, I'm sure that this is true of, like, you know, some of the wonderful smaller platforms as well, you'll see that their messaging is very much about forming human connections. And so I, I, I see a sort of like, you know, a magical almost alignment between what's in the interest of humanity in general and what might be the profit maximizing 
motives of platforms. I mean, there's a certain look you have, Francesca, that, that would uh, be the ideal suggests case. that like you know you've it's got skeptical. your eye on the clock. Um, I've I've developed like over the years the ability to sort of keep talking without pausing. <laughs> um, this is like you know this, this a is a skill, skill that yes. you acquire. And well. Um, I really would hope that uh, we would find a way for pro profit maximization and also maximization of human connectedness would be overlapping. So that's definitely something we should all work towards. Um, I'm sorry that our time is up. I wish we would have had time for questions from the audience, but I just suggest you come and talk with all of us afterwards or in the lunch break. There's, there's so a um, couch in the corner there that you can come and meet us be on. Be surfing on yes. it. So thanks a lot, both of you, and thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.